in Psychonauts, the um, game was inspired by when the creator, whatever his name was, he was like asked, what color is the sky in your world? And like one time at the dinner table. And so he took inspiration from that to create it. Like there's a famous character called the Milkman in uh, Psychonauts. And his famous line is, I'm the Milkman, my milk is delicious. Cinematic Fantastic. Atul, Barada, Nikto. I'll show you who I am and what I am. Buy a werewolf and leaves, becomes a werewolf himself. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Hello and welcome to the Cinematic Fantastic Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Weatherford. And your other host, William Weatherford. Get ready for opinions, dad jokes, and bad jokes. As we watch and review sci-fi and fantasy films from the classics of yesteryear to the new favorites of today. Hey listeners, uh, you've joined us once again. You haven't run away, we haven't driven you away yet with our with our nerdy film uh reviews uh this is jason and this is william of course yes and we are still in the 20s we're in the silent era though we've backtracked slightly from der Golem. like slightly have we yeah have we we, so, we did uh, them out of order never again though well nah, we might do things a little bit out of order it's just kind of we have we have that freedom there's no shackles on us yeah so the thing about uh, the thing about this movie is it's all, it's related in some ways to Der Golem. They're both German. Well, that that's true, but the, there's some relationships with these two uh, those two movies. Uh, again, when you're in Germany and you're making movies, there's going to be some crossover as far as you know, as far as those things, as far as you know, who who inspired who, you know, who who influenced who. You're you're all a bunch of artists. You're inspired by German ex, uh, expressionism, which we talked about that last time. We'll kind of go over some elements of German expressionism that showed up in this movie. We didn't even tell the name of this movie. We'll just call it this movie, the movie that must not be named, like Voldemort. Yeah, no, it, it'd be. Uh, <laughs> It's called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which just sounds like... Very spooky. It sounds like an awesome, scary book from, like, you know, from the old days. Yeah. Also, something very interesting is that it's spelled with a C instead of the German K. Right. And I think... I, I don't... To make it more mysterious. I think that, the, yeah, there, there was a reason for that. And maybe maybe so that they could do the alliteration of having C of C, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Possibly. Could be. Yeah. So again, this um, res- restoration that we watched um, was also from negatives because they're really cool. However, unlike being an A negative and a B negative, this was O negative, just like my blood type. <laughs> oh no! Well, j- all yeah. right, guys, bad jokes off. Just get them. Just get them right out of the jump. You know, just go ahead and do some now. What I can tell you about yeah. about Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is the one we watched is one that is freely available on YouTube currently. I, which is amazing. I really, yeah, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I heard it for, with a couple different soundtracks, but if you want one that's really banging and creepy and very industrial, uh, Thomas Lack. Did you listen to the one with Thomas Lack? Um, I think it was uh, Thomas Tallis. No, it wasn't Thomas Tallis. Thomas Tallis was a medieval, uh, medi- medieval <laughs> uh, choral writer. No, I'm uh, no Thomas Lack did a kind of industrial kind of. Um, it sounds kind of te- techno creepy. Is that what? Is that the one you did? Um, like what was your what was sound? I don't remember. Well, th- this one b- would be very familiar, actually. I'll. But they should still be all really the same. Yeah, I'll pull it up for you after. See, the thing is, a lot of times people, you know, will write soundtracks, you know, modern soundtracks, uh, to kind of um, to kind of reinter it reinterprets the movie in a way. Um, there's a movie coming up that we'll do probably next. It's called Nosferatu. Uh, of course, it's a vampire movie, yay. Uh, and there is an industrial, which is kind of a, it's kind of a very, very specific uh, electronic music style. 
And I wonder if I can find that one uh, when we watch that. I don't know. Uh, yeah, no but promises. of course these are all silent movies, so they don't originally have soundtracks. They, they are added no, in before. No, they did originally have a soundtrack, but... But we don't have the one that they played, and it was probably really old not, anyway. Not all. We don't always have the soundtrack. We Sometimes we do have the sheet music, and sometimes there are groups that are very... that try to keep that... You know, they try to play that and be, you know, honor, honor, honor the original, but... On, honestly, you know, these movies are ripe for, for reinterpretation as far as, you know, if you can't reinterpret the pictures directly on the screen, then you can kind of play music behind it. It gives a whole nother feel. Um, so, okay, first off, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Let's give a little bit of info on who made it. It's directed by Robert Vine. Looks like Wiene. Uh, no jokes. Uh, Robert Vine, written by Hans Janowitz and Carl Mayer. Uh, and the fact, even, even, even these two guys, I know that normally you're like, oh, the writers, uh, you know, how, how much of an interesting story that do they have actually quite an interesting one because yeah, this one, this specific movie is like, it is a step up from like the ones that we watched like previously, like man. And also we haven't like given spoiler warnings yet. So, I mean, this is like a, um, seven like 80 like so many years old movie so if you haven't like watched it and you probably haven't i'd suggest like we're probably we're gonna talk about it as if you've seen it so um spoil some we'll give our first spoiler warnings uh for that because it's a really great movie and it's got a really great uh plot which we'll uh, dig into. I I did like I did like the Golem a lot, and I do like this one. That you can see where they influenced movies coming. I would call this. Some people would say this is the first really great horror movie, and I would not say that's wrong. But I would say it's a very. Spe- I'd say that's like pretty true. It's a specific kind of horror. Uh, it's called psychological horror, where it deals with. The horror of of su- the the suspense uh, of 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 anxiety, uh, terror, uh, and the mind, you know, the workings of the mind, um, how our minds can lie to us, how we can lie to our own minds, how we are out of control, that we can be in someone else's control, which that's a real big uh, plot point of this movie, which makes it all the richer. It does. The thing about it is, though, somebody modern might watch this and go, oh, yeah, well, I saw that twist coming a mile off. I'll bet you it's this. You know the reason why? Because this one was the first one to really try a twist ending. And, and, you know, these were all, you know, these were all the ones that were that were trying these experiments out, uh, you know, and, and, and influenced tons of movies coming after. There's probably some, there's some ones... Some movies at the very end of this podcast uh, episode that I'm going to list, and everybody that's seen those movies is going to go, "Oh yeah, of course." So yeah, but okay. So if you want, if you yeah. want to think about okay, what the style of this movie is, and of course it's German expressionist. But honestly, I could just show you this movie, and you'd be like, "Oh, I get it." Um, the German expressionist, though, it it wasn't a movie thing; it was a stage thing. It was a, it was the thing they did on stage. And it was just an application of that to film. And the thing, one thing, one thing we'll talk about later is this movie actually convinced people that it really was an art form. I mean, you know, it, it, it really had an artistry to it. And some people were like, oh, well, whatever. You just copied off of the, you know, the stage plays and, and people, you know, and, you know, look, the movie is very influential and you cannot knock it for that. You cannot take that away from it. Yeah. Also... Um, another thing with, like, the painting style, like, the Van Gogh sort of, like, aesthetic, is that for those who know the twist ending, of course, it is, um, it kind of feels like the representation of, like, the psychosis of, uh, Francis and how he's picturing, like, this made-up story as, like, uh, an imaginary tale and, like, the way he portrays it, like, with the shadows and stuff and, like, all the things that they do and the curves and stuff of the abnormalities are part of his brain and, like, the 
whirling of his brain like the <laughs> right that the twists and the, and the, the sharp lines and and the pointed forms and structures so the thing is about that is that it's with expressionism it's really what's going on inside people's hearts and minds is is displayed out on the stage and in this case out on the scene so uh it's kind of a perfect it's it's if you had to pick a style that would work really well for just if you just knew what the story was and you're like, I wonder what style we should use, something twisted like this is just it's perfect for it. Yeah. So this story is a um one of the first instances of a frame story, which is a story within a story. It is a story about someone telling a story, basically. You just forget uh that they're telling a story. Basically, for this entire time, it uh, takes place within the inner story, and the outer story is mostly forgotten. Yeah, yeah. The the, th- the thing about the thing about it is you forget it until you realize, oh yeah, we're 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 being told a story. You know, and and a lot of, a lot of movies will do that. Um, a movie that came out in the '90s was called Forrest Gump, where the main character Forrest Gump is sitting down on a bench. And he's offering, of course, he just he offers his uh, somebody sitting down next to him a story. Well, of course, he offers him a box, uh, some chocolates because life is like that. It's like a box of those. So he gives it to him, and then he tells the story. He says, "You know, I, I I did this and such and this and such," and you know, and then and then the story continues on when he gets up off the bench at the very end of the movie and goes and does something else. Yeah, but of course, we're not covering a Forrest Gump today, or. No. Not for like a while, yeah, so the th- if at yeah, all, or at all, because we're we're, yes. we're mainly focusing on on fantasy and science fiction films. Bl- but there are some other movies that that uh, Williams Williams been curious about, and I've been dying for him to to see. Um, and we'll talk about those. Those will be special. We'll talk. Yeah, but right now, um, let's get off this tangent. <laughs> and um, we were t- originally talking about uh, the creators, okay. of the movie, okay. the uh, director. So let's go back on to there. Okay, we so got a bit sidetracked. We'll go a little bit into it. So that's fine. We're mixing right, it up. Right, right. Yeah, mix it up. This, this is this is just two people having a conversation. So, so the, the <laughs> so the script was inspired by <laughs> different experiences that um, uh, the Hans Janowitz and Carl Mayer had. They were both pacifists, so they did not like war uh, or violence. Uh, they were. They had experiences with the military during World War One, which was, of course, previous to this, and they were very distrustful of authority figures, um, which definitely comes into play about a, a couple different times in the movie, and we'll we'll talk about those when we get to them. Um, so, and one hey, one good thing about uh, the reason why we probably a lot of people saw this movie at the time was there were. Uh, foreign film industries were easing the restrictions on the import of German films after World War II. So it actually got pe- people... Because saying, Hitler was, like, out of commission. Hitler wasn't even in commission yet, actually. So that I, well, this, is, this is World War I. Uh, it was Kaiser... Kaiser Wilhelm was the leader. Sorry, William. That's another, there's another William. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm... Nah, it's fine. Kaiser, yeah, it's fine. Kaiser Wilhelm uh, was the leader of Germany at the time. So that was kind of ending. We weren't getting into into the rise of Nazism yet. Actually, the rise of Nazism... Not for like a... 10, 13, 13 years? 13 years. Yeah, you're, that's about right. Um, yeah, that's about wouldn't right. get into that until then. And I will tell you that it did... Um, it did affect the careers of two of the actors in this movie. And I think you're going to find it interesting. All right, so yeah, so, so let's talk about the people. Okay, do you want to talk about some of the some of the actors in this? Of course. Okay. Fire All away. right. So um, when we talk about the plot, we'll talk about who this who this character is. Um, it's uh, Werner Krauss is the actor who plays Doctor Caligari. He's you know very very creepy. Um, he actually he was a very famous German stage and film actor. Um, he was in a lot of plays in the early 20th century before this. So, um, but what made him, I would say, highly controversial um, amongst a lot of people is that he was what we would call an anti-Semite. He he was he was against, he was against Jewish people. 
He he thought they were trash. Um, I mean, it's just it's racist, right? So he was in a he later on was in a movie um, that had some collaboration with the Nazis, specifically um, Joseph uh, Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels was the um, he was basically the guy Hitler put in charge of convincing the masses that that Nazism was awesome. Um, yeah, real great job. But he was he was like the propaganda master. So any he was uh, Joseph Goebbels was really I'm not saying that he was a good person. I'm saying he was smart because he realized that movies could influence people. So if you had movies that had elements in it that were anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish, then you could you could kind of push people towards, hey, you know, you're you're going to the movie for entertainment, and we're creep, you know, sneaking these little bits in. And then you go about your daily life, and then we have the Nazi party come in and go, oh, we're, we're going to save you from all that. It's just really sus. Um, very, not very good propaganda. No, it's not. Well, it, was, it, was, it worked really well for the Nazis, but after the Nazis lost, um, uh, Werner Krauss, really, his life started really sucking, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so he was a really good actor. Um, he had a title, somebody had given him the title of the man of a thousand faces. Um, of course, well, we're going to go, we're going to, we have another movie coming up, coming up where there was an American, uh, who was called the man of a thousand faces and his name was Lon Chaney. We're going to go into him in a couple movies. You'll, you'll really, you'll enjoy him and his son. I'm sure when we get to his son's work. Okay. So, um, another fellow actor, her name was Elizabeth Bergner. She called him the greatest actor of all time. Of course, you know, that's, of course, She's his friend, so she'd say that. A demonic genius. genius. Um, he was un- unapologetic. If, if somebody said you're an anti-Semite, he'd be like, yeah, I am. Um, okay, yeah. so, so, so here's the deal. The movie that really got him, uh, you know, people were kind of going, oh, yikes. You know, big yikes on this guy. There, uh, 1934, there was a movie, it was called Jude Sus. I, I think that's how I pronounce it. It, it, it meant... So like Jew sus. Uh, it actually, well, the guy's name, the the character's name was Sus, and I know that's a whole Gen X, Gen Z thing about suspicious. But the thing is, the probably only thing that was suspicious was uh, was Werner Krauss's in, in uh, connection with this movie. In 1934, though, Conrad Veidt, who plays Cesar, the the somnambulist or the sleepwalker, he was in a movie called Jude Sus, and it was it was sympathetic. To Jews, and it was made uh, in, in in Britain. Um, see, in, see, in 1934, which is later on after this movie was made, uh, Conrad Veidt was in Britain. He's he was actually not. He did not like the Nazis whatsoever. I mean, you know, he was he was against against Nazism before being against Nazism was cool. So, and Conrad Veidt, there's some other awesome things about him, honestly. So, okay, so here's here's the thing: the book. That uh, that the movie was based that movie was based on by uh, Fuchtwanger. Uh, these names, man. All right, uh, it actually was sympathetic to Jews, and that the 1934 film adaptation of it was too. But the 1940 one that the Nazis did was not. So, uh, yikes! All right, so um, uh, you said that Conrad Weick was like uh, the demonic something. No, no. Said. Uh, Werner Werner Krauss was was called a demonic genius by his fellow actors. Conrad Veidt was the guy who played Cesar, the the sleepwalker, the somnambulist. Conrad Veidt, all right. He uh, was in uh, movies like in, in 1919. He was in a movie called Different from the Others, which was kind of, which was very groundbreaking because you know it. It showed people of, you know, uh, alternate, um, let's say, lifestyles, right? Uh, then The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, 1920. And then he was in a movie called The Man Who Laughs in 1928. Uh, some people will recognize that if they're Batman fans because The Man Who Laughs had a character in it called Gwynplaine. And Gwynplaine was a character who had his lips, like, like cut off. And you know what his mouth looked like. It looked like... The Joker grin, and so the uh, he he would he would wear this covering over the bottom of his face in in the movie, and his image of his face with that smile on it uh, inspired uh, Bill Finger, um, and of course Bob Kane to create um, specifically the Joker, 
uh, you know, as 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 Batman's arch arch nemesis. So, and then next uh, for these people, we're gonna um, probably gloss over them a little bit more um, before we take a break. Is uh, we have Friedrich Fair as uh, Francis, who is the main character and hero of our story. We have Lil DeGover as uh, Jane, who is the girlfriend. And of course, sorry for butchering names. One interesting because... thing about about Lil Dagover uh, that I found, I didn't find a lot of interesting things about her, but I did find out that mainly the most interesting thing about her is her film career spanned between 1913 and 1979. So she had about 80 years of acting, and it, she she act very impressive. She acted for quite a long time. So who play? Who yeah. play, uh, So we've got Hans Heinz. Twar- Von Twan- Twardowski as Alan, uh, who is who is uh, Francis's Francis's friend. homeboy, and we have Rudolph Lettinger as Doctor Doctor Olson, Olson who's... who's basically Jane's dad. Is honestly, yeah. he doesn't have a lot of. I would say he doesn't have a lot of speaking lines, but it's a silent movie. Nobody <laughs> does. <laughs> Nobody does. Well, okay. okay. Now, one one last thing to talk about. Before we take a break, yeah. after reading about um, a, uh, Conrad Veidt, this there's one really cool thing that I learned about him. He um, he got paid lots of money as an actor, and we mo- he moved to Britain. He was like, "Here, have here, uh, Britain, have all my money, as much as I can give you for the war effort." So he's like, "Stop the Nazis! Here, here's my money." You know, and it's just, it just, there's so many moments where I go, I wonder if this guy's awesome or not. And then he, then he, then he proves it. The only thing that was kind of his, the, in, the enemy of Conrad Veidt was his, uh, he had a little trouble speaking English to start out with. So when they switched over to, quote, talkies, he had some trouble. Also, here's the thing. Jo- uh, Joseph Goebbels has this racial questionnaire, right, where everybody employed in the German film industry, they had to declare their, quote, race to continue to work, right? So when he's filling it out, they asked him a question about what your race was, and he wrote he was a Jew. He was not Jewish, but his wife, his, his uh, she was the love of his life. She was Jewish, and he would never renounce her. He's like, I will never, I, I'm just going to say I'm a Jew. And they were like... Very controversial. Yeah, for there. And they, but not for him, because he was like, I'm going to do the right thing. So I don't know. This guy's this guy's kind of awesome. Uh, so basically, uh, they they later on they they moved to Hollywood. Um, like I said, he they were trying to make movies with Britain, and Britain and America were trying to make movies to get the U.S. to join the war against the Nazis because we were very isolationist until about 1941. We're like we're like ah oh, we. You know, that's something happening over there in Europe. We won't really get involved. And they were like, let's make movies to show how terrible the Nazis were. And they were bombing uh, the the UK and Europe. And he's like, I will give you all my money. Let's, you know. Also, if because he had a German accent, they were putting him in Nazi roles a lot. And he's like, he had a, a, a contract, a line item in his contract that said, if I play a Nazi, they have to be a villain. How awesome is that? He's like, I'm not going to show them as a hero at all. So, hey, you know, um, I don't want to clap for the guy because it would it would be too loud on the podcast. But uh, clap, clap, sir. Clap, clap. Clap, 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 clap. Yes. So And then one half clap. And, yeah, yeah. And then a quarter clap. Give him a quarter. Give him as many as he wants. Um, and also, you know, anybody who inspires an awesome villain like the Joker can't be can't be bad at all uh we're definitely going to see some batman movies later on in this podcast so we'll get to experience the joker so anyway enough enough on that so these two actors um you know we've got uh, we've got conrad thumbs up and then we've got Werner, whose uh career after the nazis were defeated he kind of is left with well i'm sorry <laughs> i you know I mean, what are you gonna say i mean you know he was in some of the most anti-semitic you know, propaganda movies the Nazis could come up with. And he's kind of like, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, it's just kind of like you have to kind of move off into the country and to, and just kind of live in uh, anonymity. Nobody knowing who you are. Uh, No, I'm not that guy at all. Yeah. So closing thoughts on the 
cast is that they were all people of different types of um, different um, support for Semites versus anti-Semitic, which was very interesting and um, historical. Well, okay, okay. So, so the, the thing about okay, the thing about the cast is, of course, the thing that that really uh, stands out is the imagery of Caesar, the somnambulist, or it's another word for sleepwalker. Is that the imagery of him with the with the white makeup, the dark around his eyes, this kind of uh, almost like a a dancer's kind of tight outfit? You know, he has he, kind of like slightly like. Uh, undead. Y- yes, like. and he's very thin too, and he he moves very, you know, very smoothly and lively, like a like almost like a like a like a creature, and uh, in the shadows, and so that. So the actor um, of Cesare, who of course um, was Conrad Veidt, yes, was um, probably pretty good at portraying that person. Absolutely, he was he was really good at at expressions. Um, you know, very, very good, I guess, you know, um, uh, a very, what we'd call a very physical actor. Cause a lot of actors will act with their eyes and their face, but he would just, you know, he was very good with you know, acting with his body. So, um, oh, also another thing about him is, is some people would not know this, but, um, if they've seen the movie, uh, Casablanca, very famous film with Humphrey Bogart, uh, in that there's a character named uh, Captain Strasser and he played him. So anybody that's like they haven't they've seen old movies but they haven't seen any really old movies they've only seen seen the old movies from like the 40s and 50s you would have seen him in that and uh you know that's a very famous movie. So that I think that was his one of his last movies. So he he yeah. uh, he passed out. So after all that. very interesting things. Yes. Indeed. So we are going to take a break and we will resume later after we've you know um done life because after all we have a life here. And uh, we will resume um, in, for what may seem to you, two seconds. And we're back. We've returned from life. Yes, we've been awakened from our sl- slumber and our sleep. It's now time to talk a little bit further about Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Woo. Woo is right. All right, so are you ready to kind of discuss the plot and what happened in the film? All right. Also, again, I'm going to have a spoilers for a five score and two uh movie old in other words it's like a century old it's it's a really good one so make sure we're going to talk about it again as um as if we've already uh as if you've already watched it so just a heads up yeah a lot of movies we're going to talk about we are going to kind of spoil some stuff yeah um like in particular this has a twist ending which we're going to talk about the story and frame of Yes, okay. So the story starts out with a man named Francis. Uh, He's sitting on, he's our main character basically. He's sitting on a bench with an older man, and the older man is complaining. He says that spirits have driven him away from his family and home. Yeah, they are spirits. They are all around us. Yes. They've driven me from hearth and home, from wife and child. Very cool first lines. All right, so. Also, something I forgot to mention was the uh, title cards. They're uh, a step up. They're pretty great. You know, they also scroll around. They're like stylized and they're like very cool and very notable. Yeah. And that's that stuff is all original to the movie that was not put in later. That was actually in it. So that's it, amazing. It, it actually really is kind of cool. You know, a, a lot of movies nowadays do weird things with the titles and they were like, uh, yeah, we're just going to do that. We're like, just you know, gonna... like the Spy Kids intros, those were pretty wacky. Yes. A lot of them do some very creative things. So, but with this, you know, uh, not a lot of movies nowadays use title cards at all for, for the, you know, for text. They just use sound. 
So they've got to do some very interesting things. And the thing about the text in it, which you'll notice as you're watching the movie, is it's really, it's got those little sharp points on everything. So it's just as twisted as what's happening in the movie. All right, so they're sitting there and they're looking off and this this woman comes by and she looks like she's in a trance. The uh, interesting way of putting that. She passes by. She's a ghost, by the way. She's a ghostly figure. She's ghostly, but she's not a ghost. But her name is Jane, supposedly. And Francis goes, "Okay, this is my fiance, and we've suffered a you know suffered a great uh, great ordeal, you know, this situation." So he turns over to to the old man and starts telling him a story. It's like a flashback. His story takes place in a this is an actual city that does exist. Uh, the writers actually heard about it, the name of it, and they were like, "Oh, we." I love that name. It's called Holston Wall. Yeah, so yeah. this is portrayed like with all the curves and stuff, the way his mind paints it. Yeah. Like it's very the dimension. It's very sharp and shadowy. Like things, and all curved and stuff and not very realistic. No, it's it's not. And it's meant it's meant to be it's meant to be what it is. It's meant to be Yeah, the only exception to that rule is uh Jane's house. Yeah, we'll we'll get to it that. It's very normal. It looking. is very smooth and, and lots lots of rounded curves and I think we'll And my theory is that because uh Jane is the love interest and so to uh Francis, Jane is like a very important person and uh who is the normal in this world. Right. That's probably the only that's thing. That's that's a good that's, that's a good theory. Okay. That, that that seems to fit seems to fit the facts. Francis is he's hanging out with his buddy Alan and they are they are actually planning on visiting the town like little the the fair which is kind of like you know state fairs I you know I'm I'm from the south the deep south and we used to have state fairs where people would would have they'd have rides and they'd have food that was really bad for you and have and so that's pretty much what I remember yeah nowadays they just suck your money like eight eight dollars oh my for goodness. like a I don't know, like a small. Oh, oh or exactly, exactly. They're so ex- they're so expensive. Four four dollars for a bottle. Oh, of water. and everything's fried from you know, uh, uh, fried Oreos, just just everything. You know, <laughs> Oreos, cars, uh, Twinkies, <laughs> everything. Everything's fried. <laughs> It's Aww. it's uh it makes your it makes your heart it makes your body it makes your heart too. your heart stop just thinking about it like I just want to have a heart attack right now thinking about it. So they're going and, and of course as you watch as you watch the movie the cool part about this is that they didn't have the space where they were filming to do all you know to do like full size sets. So if you look off in the, in the in the background, some of the spinning merry grounds are actually like they're smaller, but they umbrellas. Yeah, they kind of they kind of do look like that, but they're kind of spinning. Um, and so they, so they, they, they give off the feeling that, yeah, there's rides, but you can't really see them up close. I actually think that's kind of cool looking. As we see this shot comes up the great Caligari as he exclaims him, or Francis, telling the man. Throughout his whole, the whole story, that's the man that freaks him out. So he says him. And we see, and we see him in a round telescopic shot. Uh, uh, Iris. Which is, um, very iconic with this movie is that it does a lot of, uh, camera shots where it like frames the portrait of what they want you to focus on and they do that a lot that is an iris in or iris out and it's very very, in fact it's so used in silent films probably because of these kind of movies it frames it around what the director wants you to see about yeah like caligari you even see he has to stoop up a little bit for him to fit in the he is he is is kind of of hunched over which is kind of shows that he's he's got some kind of secret plan going on here yeah, he's like portrayed his character. He's kind of like this shady, shifty sort of guy, and he's like salesman sort of thing. But like, he doesn't really sell anything. He's just like selling his uh fared spot, which we'll talk yeah, about. Yeah. So first thing, he has to get a permit from the town clerk, which you would you wouldn't think that this scene would be in there that long, and it's not very long, but it's just enough for you to see that. He has to get to an authority figure and kind of ask them. And they're all they're on the they're actually on this chair that's like ten feet above him. To me, it shows that even even somebody who thinks he's all great, like Caligari, has to go and get to a town clerk who think you know who's probably not very tall. He puts himself on, and has to sit on a lowly bench. Exactly. So the town clerk is on a really really high chair, which is like there's someone always above you in the bureaucracy, man. Yeah, always got to be some sort of dictator in Germany. Oh my goodness, that's 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 really that's ter- actually that's. That's actually some of the points that the that the writers were trying to make. I don't know if everybody like understood that at the time, but they were really trying to make a point about that. Like there has to always be a villain around. Well, it's 
in these parts. What it is, what it is, 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 is there is there point. is there's always a measure of control. They're always trying to control people. Caligari's trying to control people. The clerk's trying to control people. Stuck in the middle is 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 Caesar because he's just he's a puppet. You know, he's he's being puppeted by authority figure. Anyway. So first off, the they, they go, Okay, what what are you trying to show at the fair? And he says, A somnambulist. I know that's a weird word. And a very long it is. one. You know you gotta go to Oxford in uh, order to understand it. Just just go to Oxford. Yeah, we'll we'll, be we'll just sit here and wait. For you. All right. Uh we'll sit here and wait while you go to college and to high school because you have to in the Just get to, an just to learn what a somnambulist just, is. Just like go through all your life just to yeah. learn one word. Out of the dictionary. Well, okay. Well, yeah, everybody everybody knows what insomnia is, okay, right? It means you can't sleep. But a somnambulist is a sleepwalker, okay? So his name is Cesar. The great Cesar. So he even, uh, the clerk, he make kind of, you know, makes fun of Caligari. You know, he's like, okay, whatever. And he and he, he approves it. You and your Mickey Mouse gloves. Oh, his Mickey Mouse gloves, yeah. yeah. White gloves with black stripes on it. So there's still a little bit of it's darkness. got three in stripes. All like Mickey Mouse. It's very Mickey Mouse looking. Okay. I, I don't know if I remember this. Is this true that the clerk is actually found stabbed to death? He's like the first victim they find? I wouldn't think so. That's who that guy was. That first, Okay. So. No, the first murder was uh, Alan. It was As, as we found, slightly skip they, ahead. They, it wasn't. The cops find. It's a very, it's a very quick scene. The, the, the cops find a body. And then it then it skips over. It just if you blink, you'll miss it. But yeah, I think the clerk gets killed. All right. So the next very interesting revenge. All right, so the next morning, well, him and his weights. The, there's a kill. There's a yeah. The weights. <laughs> yeah. There's a killer later, and he says the other two murders. So it'd be the clerk and and Alan. All right. All right. So the next morning, uh, Francis and Alan they're going to see his spectacle, which you know, so he's like you know. You know, step right up and see. Basically, it's one of those in a lot of those movies where they have like right yeah, step up. R- yeah, he even does right that. So up. he does. Um, yeah, he rolls his R's. A lot of these movies where they have like a freak show or something like that, they'll have somebody stand outside and say, "Oh, for a penny, you can see the freak, the dog faced boy, or something." But in this, um, he he spreads it. Yes, you know, exactly. The strongest man so in the world. He spreads out a a sheet that has a pitch, picture of Cesar. And so people come in and they're very curious, including Francis and Alan. They're like, okay, Francis and Alan want to check this out. And it's and it's really strange. In fact, the first time that C- Cesar opens his eyes and his eyes go wide like that, it's all like close up on his face. And there's a, a story that some women were sh- would in the theater early on would like shriek when they'd see his face. So he does look creepy. So He's showing yeah. off Cesar to people and he wakes them up. You know, he walks them around. And then he says that he uh, that he will like give a prophecy of anything that you ask of, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing that uh, we forgot to address was that uh, the sh- shadowing is also pretty interesting. Like the set work, they paint the shadows onto the scenery, and the entire like landscape is painted, which also kind of represents the uh, d- demented reality. But also, the the thing is Francis. though. The, the shadows painted on every, everything, they could film the scene and film it again, and it would still be as creepy. Where, whereas you'd have to use special effects to kind of make it look as creepy again. You know, you have to, you have to use actual lighting. But with this, you could actually paint, you, know, you could do all the paint, all the shadows yourself. And it's, it's a way of maybe maintaining the creepy factor throughout, I think. A lot of times in, in those expressionistic stage plays, they would paint the shadows on things. So that's, a, that's where that came from. Francis is like, no, let's not do it. And Alan goes, how long am I going to live? And then Cesar, he says, the time is short. You die at dawn. <laughs> dead dead by dawn. Dead by dawn. And then he's like, well, he, he's kinda what sc- on earth? He's kind of sc- well, well, not he's really. He's frightened. Just like- <gasps> and then he just starts laughing. I guess it's like, oh, yeah, right. This is stupid. Yeah, right, I'm gonna die. Like, I haven't, like, gone to the bar uh, too heavily. Yeah, he's fine. So I so should when be they, fine. Uh, but I think um, when they're on their way home, don't they Don't they see Jane for a moment? And then they go, hey, they both like her. Yeah, they meet Jane for the first time they as they like, go well, to yeah, the Yeah, they fair. both like her. And they go, well, whoever whoever she's, she dates, you know, will be cool. So they're still bros, you know. They're not like letting a girl get in between them, which that's pretty, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty modern to them. But I don't know; it doesn't always work out that way. 
Also, another thing is that I'm really sad that the fair monkey was yeah, only shown in oh, one oh, scene. Oh, oh there was yeah, okay, a it's monkey called a, that was there. It's guy, it was an actual that, monkey. It has it was called an organ grinder. What, because what he would do is he he has like a little instrument with a little crank on it, and you crank it, and it makes music. And the and the monkey is supposed is on a little chain or whatever, and he's supposed to dance or you know hop around and stuff, which is kind of interesting because yet another. Th- being under the control of someone else, making them, you know, making them move to the beat, uh, or the, you know, whatever rhythm they want them to, you know. So everybody's, I, th- All I very think interesting I saw that. Stuff. I was like, okay, that another yet another creature that's on somebody's chain here. All right. So, um, so what happens is the chains, the and chains, the pains. The pains. So at night, Alan's sleeping, and he 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 stirs and wakes up, and there's a shadowy figure. We later find out it's Cesar, but he he's he's on top of him and he he stabs him with a with a knife and they and they do the sh- It's not they're shown. not shown it's actually. Shadow, it's they, a they, they shadow. It's kind of this is what they were experimenting with with that kind of thing, and, and this is the first one, one. Also, another thing that's really interesting that might be a really interesting right. but wrong theory is that since the shadow doesn't look like too much like Cesar, it could also be uh, Francis. Might have killed Alan for, I don't know, maybe he was, that, like, jealous of you think, Jane. You think? Secretly. Or not secretly. I don't know. He, I don't he know killed Alan in, like, jealousy. It's, it's supposed to be That's, Cesar because later on. <laughs> Thousands of grains of salt throw it behind right. your back. And, and so, so here's and what happens. So uh, when Francis finds out, he's totally sad. He's just he's just broken, heartbroken. And he gets with Jane and tells her that Alan's dead. And they get help from her father, uh, Do- Dr. Olson, and they get authorization to investigate. They're like, I think that it was Cesar who did it. It's got to be. That later that, uh, let's see, later that night, there's a criminal and he's like trying to murder an old woman and the cops grab him. And when they question him, he goes, yeah, I tried to kill the old woman, but... I didn't do the two previous deaths. I was taking advantage of the situation, and I was kind of pushing blame off for myself. Yeah, because after all, they're worried about another killer, then what's another killer? They're just like, oh, a killer. Right, we already right. know about a killer when but there's Fra- a but secondary still killer. He's like, okay, well, list. that means that it's got to be Cesar. So he's got to go... He's very sure about it. The blame he put it well, on. Well, he's uh, kind Cesare, of right, isn't which he? Which is um, because it's a very impactful moment. Which is um, everything was normal until his friend Alan disappeared, and then he went into a uh, delusion and neurosis over uh, the pain of his uh, death that he had to blame uh, Cesare. Yeah, yeah, but and, yeah, but he uh, was Caligari. right though. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure that the that, that Cesar, you know, murdered. Uh, he's because he's under control of Caligari. That's that's that's. It's it all weird. weird. So Francis all is very like weird. he's spying on Caligari in this weird looking. It looks like a trailer park. <laughs> one of those trailer park deals. It's, it's just it like is, a really it, tiny it's house. Like leans over to the side, like it's not even. Oh, yeah, it's just a door and a window. Yeah. It's him and, and it a looks coffin. Like Ce- it looks like Ce- it looks like Cesar is sleeping is. in the in the eponymous cabinet. Yeah, what's really uh, cool as well about it is that they show a shot where they're looking into him uh, with Cesar um, lying in the uh, cabinet, which is like the coffin-looking yeah. thing, the cabinet that he comes from, and um, Caligari. They're sitting there, and the window kind of ah. looks like a jail cell, which see, is see, pretty there, interesting parallel. The notice again. There is there symbolism be, yeah, everywhere. There is in this one definitely. So okay, so but it's not Cesare. It's actually a dummy um, that looks like him. So he he's like, I mean, he very, looks well, like a just, dummy he, anyway. He, like, kinda, he just lays there and doesn't <laughs> it do, it doesn't move. So okay, so but Cesare is actually sneaking into into Jane's house to get her while she's sleeping. He like raises the knife to stab her, and that's freaky. Oh oh yeah yeah. He, he he he's you can see him from across the room and he slowly approaches and it's very suspenseful. I'm sure people were like, "Oh no, oh no." He comes in, he tries he's about to stab her, but he he can't because she's beautiful. Like she's so beautiful, he's yeah, just she's like, beautiful. <laughs> inside inside and they just has to steal her away like all villains do 
Yeah. First oh, oh, oh I happens. get it. I get that one. <laughs> Always got oh, a dragon he, girl he by kinda a hair. Just her on. He hoists her on his. Well, hip, he doesn't kinda. really. He's, he is. He is dra- He is kind of. He's just slumping her around. You know, like a like a sack of potatoes. And is uh are the original tension that Caligari probably had for Cesare was to um kill her, but his uh disobedience of Caligari is pretty interesting yeah, okay. for his so uh, he, character. He takes uh her out the window and other people wait in the house wake up and they very quickly I don't know, it's insanely quickly how quickly they got uh, like an angry mob together. I mean if we watch when you watch nineteen thirties Frankenstein, it takes them a little while to gather the mob up to go after Frank because after all, they were over on a red herring because they're like, um, they go over to his house like earlier and then they go like, open up, we um, want to see if Cesare is there. Uh, and then, then when they see he's there, they're just, yeah, like, exactly. they're just like, what? Right, right. I, I thought it was him, but it, it was, was a red herring, red herring so, uh, all along. Cesare is running after red and herring. he eventually he drops Jane and he like runs off and he collapses and dies i mean you know okay he I, he, he I passed know. out he just he just he, he's 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 just like i've been i've been going for too long he's not he's been off killing sleep. people the too dude's long. been sleeping for like 20 something years he's not it's not like he's tired <laughs> all of a sudden i don't well, know I, the, the plot said so Fra- the plot Fra- said francis, so. francis said, said so. so the the script said so uh, the writers wrote it that way. That's why. Francis is, he says, okay, the criminal, he, he checks on the criminal. The criminal was locked up the whole time, so it couldn't have been him, right? It couldn't have been the attacker. So they're like, okay. So they go and investigate the sideshow, and they find out that it's just a dummy. And while they're doing that, Caligari, like, runs off, and Francis chases him. And where does he end up? In the insane Where insane does asylum. he end up? But another really cool thing is that um, before he went to go kill slash uh, capture Jane, like he went to capture Jane, before that he was like hanging to the wall, like kind of like a shadow. So you're talking about, it's you're like talking about really Cesar? cool. Yeah, Cesare, he was like hanging it's to the very, wall in order to go It's very in. like he's slinking around kind of very snake-like and very like a cat. Like a, he, like he, a cat. Versus uh, Francis going around the night, kind of like all in all forms. Yes, uh, right. Kind of like a mouse. He's scampering around. He doesn't know he's not a uh, no, night he's adept not like Cesare is. Because he, he doesn't, doesn't go kill he's, people he's, for he's, a living. He's, he's, he used to be a nice guy until all this stuff happened to him. You know you got the yeah. pay. <laughs> yeah, you okay, you're man. Okay. You okay. So Francis goes into there, and he's like, okay... You know, I know there's this guy Caligari, and they're like, we, "There's no Caligari here. Maybe the director can help you." And they send him into the to see the director of the asylum, and guess who it is? It's Caligari, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, yes!" And then he's like, "What? This is so just Caligari a goes, massive twist goes, ending." I'll call him Caligari. Sorry. So he goes to sleep, and while he's asleep, the I don't know what the staff must just not like not like him because they're like, "Yeah, let's investigate and prove that he's not who he is." I mean, most places they would be like. I'm sorry, this is our director's office. You can't be in here after hours. Please leave. But they're like, yeah, let's look around. And they're like snooping around. They must not like the guy. So they're snooping around. They find his records and his diary while he's sleeping. Okay, so he's obsessed with this story of an 18th century mystical guy named Caligari who used, guess what, a somnambulist, a.k.a. a sleepwalker named Cesar, to commit murders in these northern Italian towns. Okay. And so th- the real um, Dr. Caligari isn't the one that we find today. He's aspired so much for Caligari from the books that he must become Caligari. Like, yeah. it's even a moment where he's walking around and there are words coming, like, from all around, like, on the landscape and all over saying that he yes. must become him to the point that he's, like, given up, and he's like, I must become... Right, and they get, and they uh, actually Caligari. bring a somnambulist in to the insane asylum to help, to be helped, and he starts experimenting on him. He becomes his Cesar, so he's almost like becoming this character he read about. So they call the police to his office, and they show him the dead Cesar, show his corpse. And then Caligari just, like, flips out, and he attacks the staff members. 
But then Francis well, saves the day like the hero Caligari. He is. They put him in a straight jacket, and he's like an inmate in his own asylum. And so then comes the happy ending for Francis, which is all delusional because turns out it's another twist ending. Yeah, after Francis a twist is in, a, uh, in the asylum as an inmate. Okay, so Jane and Cesar are patients as well. So Jane, the character, is actually someone who imagines herself as the queen of the asylum, while Cesare is just leaning he's just back a, and he's, he's like, he's just, just a quiet guy, not very dangerous looking, right? But Francis has concocted this story all along, and he was truly, like, insane. Yeah. And plus, it's really funny how, like, he looks very insane, like, right after Alan's death when he's with the uh, police. And they have a scene where he's just, like, expressing himself with no words because yeah. there wasn't a title card for that part. But they're just, like, staring at him, like... So this is probably... His world is overlaid on top of the real world, so the real story is, like, he's cuckoo. So then... He attacks what happens Caligari, next? and Caligari, like... Then they put Francis in a straitjacket and put him in the same room that, that Caligari was put in a straitjacket in his delusion. So then Caligari, he then goes, Ah, now I know what he's all about. He thinks I'm Caligari. Now we can finally right. know how so, to cure but, him. But then, but then it zooms in on Caligari's uh, insane asylum director's face, and it, and it irises in. It kind of makes you think: Okay, is it really? <laughs> is that really true? Who knows? First off, when you take off the thing about the unreliable narrator, I mean, er- everything you've seen, you're you're always calling into question, and that's what psychological horror is all about: is is calling into question your own mind and your own you know, delusions and your own, you know, what you think is real. And it's, and, and it's just, it messes with you. That, so that's what, and, and interferes made, uh, made solid on the outside uh, in, you know, in the waking world. So that's, that's the plot. You know, like it was pretty cool, you know, plot, yeah, the cliff, uh, cliff, cliff notes edition. Exactly. Weather, Weatherford Weatherford edition. edition. All right. So it was written by Hans Janowitz and Carl Mayer. And remember, they were pacifists. They met after World World War One. They did. There was actually a point where Mayer did not want to be in military service during the war, so he feigned. He acted crazy. So he had these intense examinations from a military psychologist or psychiatrist, and you notice that he's already getting some of the ideas for Caligari from the psychiatrist guy, and. They had this actress who Carl Mayer was in love with named Gilda Langer, and she encouraged them to write a film together, but she went off and did her own thing, so she couldn't be in it. So she was the basis for the Jane character. She also encouraged uh, Hans Janowitz to go visit a fortune teller, and they predicted that, that Hans would survive his military service, but but uh, but Langer would die, right? It was true, because Langer died in 1920 at the age of 23, well, so kind of. Well, it's story. based on, or based on, right. ba- Based on and some events. The, you'll never guess the filmmaker that was in, that influenced them to make this. It was Paul Wegener, the same guy who made the Golem, who was the Golem. Yeah, it was his films. It was his his films kind of inspired the the design. So again, these guys are all you know connected. When the two writers went to a circus sideshow in Berlin, they saw something called Man or Machine, where this guy performed feats of great strength after he had been hypnotized. So that's where they were like, ah, that's what we're going to do. I mean, there's all these different things like Janowitz thought that he had seen a murder near an amusement park in 1913 beside beside the city of Holstenwall. So there so there's the, that too. There's all these different things that that happened, you know, and they put it in there. Some of the other things about it is that is the frame story. They actually remember when I said it before, they did not want to do that. They were like, we. They're like, we want a normal story. We want a normal ending. <laughs> None said, of that. Yeah, when uh, they, good story. When they saw the um, film, trash. the frame story, they said it was it was a, a, and I quote, an illicit violation of our work. It turned the film into a cliche, in which the symbolism was to be lost. So they even tried to do legal action to stop the changes to the movie of the of the frame story. But it was all for the better anyway, because it's a really rich story, and it's got some really great symbolism, and it's got, like, you know, the subjective well, the, the, state of reality. Well, you know, like, reality the, the, is whatever yeah, the you frame want to be story, The frame story 
though makes it, you know, brings in the psychological horror elements, which is more a stylistic thing. And they were trying to do something with, you know, with talking about authority and, you know, the mistrust of authority and how they're turning, you know, people into into mindless zombies and, and puppets. Uh, that is interesting, but did kind of get lost a little bit. It made it more about the story than the underlying meaning that they were trying to get out there. A lot of times writers will write a story, uh, you know, for film, and they'll try to inject all this meaning into it, and that's great, but sometimes the regular Joe Sixpack public doesn't really get a lot of those things. They just want to go see a really good movie. So the uh, the actual film studio will, will go, okay, well, we're, we'll you know, we'll... We'll just we'll recut this, you know, and make it this way and the other, and then the director just has to kind of go. Well, I guess, oh well. So it, it's been happening for a long time. I mean, a lot of directors have their own idea of what they want the movie to be, and sometimes the film studio has their own ideas, and sometimes they clash, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the you know the, the director actually gets their vision out there. Yeah, it's very like. Yeah, it's like when you go to editors, it's just like very probably like you're just like sitting there like, uh, uh, is my work going to be cut destroyed? to ribbons? You know, you know, that's why they call it the cutting room floor, because it's just like it sounds like it's, you know, some of these movies, it's like almost like a bloodbath because they're just you you create all this story and it becomes your baby. And they're just you know, they're you're killing they're killing your child. <laughs> they're killing your you know, cutting him to bits, and he turns out into like yeah. I don't know, an arm yeah, and a it's leg. Nothing, nothing, and like he's just, he's just, just, just a skeleton, a bare skeleton he's of just, a story. But honestly, it, honestly, the story still it still holds up today. A lot of it that st- a lot of the stuff that it still holds up is is how it, it's influenced on a lot of other other movies and things like that. Um, I bet you didn't know this. This is so connected to Golem. It's not even funny. So, guess who the guy is that they wanted to be Cesar in the first place? Ha- the assistant. Yes, Hans, Hans Janowitz. Hans Janowitz's friend yeah. was Ernst Deutsch, who played the assistant guy in The Golem. Um, he would have fit he, the he, role he, he, uh, yeah. pretty well. But uh, Cesar is. But I mean, who knows? They picked the actor, and the actor Conrad, was uh, pretty good. But I don't know what a, the assistant Veit would look like awesome. with makeup. Okay, he's, he's awesome. <laughs> All right, now Janowitz did write the part of Caligari specifically for Werner Krauss because they were like, okay, we see we saw a play by this guy named Max Reinhardt, and they were like, Werner Krauss was in that, and they they saw him and went up. Oh, that's Caligari right there. But they they said if we can't get Krauss, we have to get Paul Wegener, you know, the the guy who played the Golem, who directed Golem. They would have to get either one of them, and they got Krauss. So. And and a lot of the stuff like the top hat, the cane, the walking stick, and the ivory handle, and all that, Werner Krauss is I that that was his idea. So that's where a lot of that a lot of that stuff came from. And the director asked the actors to make movements like dance. So if you notice, especially from Conrad Veidt, so if you notice that they look like they're almost doing a dance, like a ballet when they're moving, that's because he told them to do that. That's why he moves along the wall so strange. Yeah, it's like even more dramatic because, of course, it's a silent movie, but it's even yeah, more dramatic it sh- than it needs to be. You know, the dramatization of uh, also Francis it was it mind. was uh, it was shot entirely in a studio, it. no exterior shots. So they had a relatively it was very small. The studio it was built back in 1914, and most of the sets did not even get long longer than six meters. I guess that's about just like three. Okay, it wasn't very big. Yeah, but it doesn't seem small because like the camera and like moves around and well, stuff. Thank and also, God yeah, for exactly. moving cameras. But also they paint a lot of the far off elements in the background, and so it kind of makes it look longer than it is. You know, there was some stuff that was cut out from the script, like there was a procession of gypsies, there was a handcart that Caligari pushes, there's a Jane had her own Ooh. carriage, and there was a, a chase scene involving horse cabs. I wonder if that was. That was uh, yeah, would be I, pretty I don't ambitious. Think they done it. So that I'm... because like the speed is immense. It's like <laughs> yeah. fifty miles yeah, an through, hour through a six Goodness. meter area. No thanks. Honestly, um, it's it's probably a good You'd idea. Be that running it was, in circles. It was cut. They have or it'd just be too fast for the camera because it's pretty. It's still pretty There's bulky. There's not a lot of shots either. There's it's basically just medium shots, straight on angles and wides, and and. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, the, of course, the, the, the telescope the close, shots. The close-up shots are for a sense of shock, you know. So there's not a lot of editing in the scenes. 
Um, they're very, you know, from scene to scene, straightforward. And, uh, you know, and honestly, everything's jagged. Like you said, you know, it's, it's all painted on there. That's, of course, you know, showing the, the inner the inner mind of the characters. Oh, except for except for Jane and Alan's home or Jane's home and Alan's home. They're they're very normal. Because they're very essential well, not only that, to uh, Francis. Because after all, it's, it's his friend well, who that, died somebody, in his love interest. I've it's heard how somebody he spun say into that, delusion that in anyway. a dream, sometimes there are normal elements in them. And so even in the midst of a nightmare. And so those are, and also it's very comforting. It's got like a refuge for him with her. But uh, the movie got got a wide distribution, but they're actually the the only the uh, there's it was actually protests yeah. at it, and the reason why there was protests is because there was a Hollywood, the Hollywood branch of the American Legion. They were nervous because of uh, of unemployment because if if you bring in German films into America, then then Thomas Edison would no, steal them and distribute no, he them. Could, he, didn't, he, could, <laughs> he couldn't. He could not get his hands Thank on goodness. this. Thank so, goodness. No, it was American. Yeah, it's a German film after right, all. American actors, American, American actors couldn't get jobs if if we kept bringing in German films. So we were like, you know, let's do American movies for American actors. Um, that's why they were kind of protesting at that. But that that's all. Um, some of the move, some of the movies that we will later do. Actually, very coming up very soon will be F. W. Murnau's Nosferatu. That was in 1922. That was the first real that we know of Dracula portrayal. It it's it off it, brand Jack Dracula. It's Kroger brand. It's Dracula. Kroger brand well, it, Dracula. It does not use the name Dracula or any of the character names from the book, but it's very dead on with the story. Very close. Also, for, yeah. uh, uh Loosely so based otherwise. So other movies otherwise. that we'll probably look at are Murders in the Rue Morgue in 1932, Dracula 1931. Those have a master hypnotizing somebody else. You know, you've got Dracula and you've got Renfield. So you've got so you've got some of those elements of of you know hypnosis and 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 and, and you know controlling. You get you know Bela Lugosi's eyes looking out you know at the audience. His just his hypnotic eyes. A lot of these things still, the inspiration still keeps going to this day. I mean, you've got, well, especially on a modern director like Tim Burton, uh, Tim Burton's designs, you know, you would see those in, in kind of the twisted visions in movies like, no, well, because no, it was talking, all about Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, that, that actually did have some, you know, some inspiration from from uh, german expressionism what else uh also like you know batman 1989's batman um yeah the way that the city is designed <laughs> very very much like you know those you know very strange strange sharp towers and everything like that so yeah although i still can't decide whether uh van gogh inspired um dr Calig uh dr caligari or dr no, caligari no, no. inspired van um, gogh Caligari's <laughs> it was probably was a was probably um inspired by a man named Arthur Schopenhauer. Um if you see him you see his hair and you're like in the way his hair tufts out to the side, you're like, Oh yeah, that's how that's that's his design. It's it's a no, Marty no. McFly from Back to the Future. <laughs> you ever you say that about everybody. <laughs> oh, no, the, oh, the professor no, guy, Doc uh, Brown. Brown. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Brown. Sorry, oh, how I get, you get those confused. confused. I don't know. Do Doctor <laughs> McFly sounds dope. Doctor McFly sounds more dope. Well, I haven't seen see, the Marty, movie yet. How, how could you get them confused? I mean, uh, great scum. Yeah. All right, that's a terrible impression. So yeah, before man. we close, I had like some more thoughts about yeah. um something pretty cool. Is um there is a game that came out. Yeah. It's like a pretty old game. It's uh, called Psychonauts yeah. by uh, Double Fine Productions. They, of course, made a sequel um, last year, but uh, that, one, that one's not as good. But, like, uh, in Psychonauts, the um, game was inspired by when the creator, whatever his name was, he was, like, asked, what color is the sky in your world? And, like, one time at the dinner table, and so he took inspiration from that to create it. Like, there's a famous character called the Milkman in uh, Psychonauts. And his famous line is, I'm the milkman, my milk is delicious. And <laughs> and so, in that level, it's called the Milkman Conspiracy, very famous, of course, uh, best in the game, very famous level and character. It's uh, all like a street, 
And it's like all twisted and everyone is like secret agents who are all conspiring against him. And he's like making conspiracy theories and stuff in his uh, his mind. And so that's kind of like how, though a lot more crazy than uh, how Francis portrays the world, Francis is probably has his own psychonauts, right. uh, psychonauts level no, abso- within absolutely. Uh, this and, and, movie. You know, and, a, and a lot of the inner struggles that are going on inside the mind are displayed in the you know, world outside the body. I mean, that's obviously with Psychonauts, you're like, that's journey to, journey to the center of someone's mind, and, and you see things. Yeah, you're figuring out how everyone sees the world because everyone sees it in a different way. It's a subjective view. And not Absolutely. Objective so, the, and the, th- the thing is, though, that's kind of what's done in this movie is the darkness that is portrayed by, you know, Caligari, and also the horrors that that Francis is seeing, and also the kind of things that the two writers were trying to show about authority are displayed in the designs of the city and and and, and the twists and turns. We're still seeing the ripples from movies like this. Yeah, and we're definitely going to see as we go through these movies, we're going to see how modern movies are, they take so much from these and and are so inspired. A lot of the inspirations that we're going to see, we're going to start to see a lot in the 1930s and 40s, especially with the Universal Monster movies. Well, and speaking of monsters, the next one that we're going to do is going to be Nosferatu. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, this movie was like really great for its age. It's like the masterpiece of the age. It's like the story is on fire, the characters are on fire, everything is on fire. Not literally, though, (laughs) of course, because uh, there's so many props they would all burn. And the title cards as well, and the entire film would burn just uh, thinking about it. If it 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 only had a brain. But, like, this is, like, the masterpiece yeah, it's, it's of the good. ages. Like, 1920, really great um, age. The age when Newt Scamander lives, so he must yeah, be absolutely. pretty happy about that. But the th- the th- <laughs> I yeah. think it was or was 1922. it 1922? The thing about but the still, 20s it was is out for there like isn't any years. sound, and so everything that they have to portray, they have to do with visuals. So I think the fact that they have to lean on visuals so much is why the imagery sticks out to us is because, yeah, yeah, limitation breeds and, and creativity. And with that, we'll have to limit our time tonight for uh, for this episode. Yeah, because after all, we've like for going on for like almost. We hope an you guys enjoyed it tonight, uh, and we hope to see you again for the next episode. Make sure to um, check out socials um, that we yep. will say um, later, and also like you know comment and give us five stars. You know. Anything available in uh, these yeah. platforms that you can do. Send us Give any us reviews a, you can support. through those. And uh, if you have any suggestions about a movie that we could cover and that we haven't like already, then that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, check it out. So uh, again, bye. Have a good one. Don't forget to open your third eye telepathically message us at cinefanpod at gmail.com set your chronoscope dial to the future setting and peruse cinematicfanpodcast.wordpress.com hunker over your ham radio as your keen ears listen for the ghostly voices tweeting on our twitter at cinematicfanta1 exchange all of your money into republic credits and donate at our patreon page at patreon.com slash Cinefan Podcast. Ending transmission now.